it's really good to see you. Now, can you remember that this week, but earlier when perhaps you watched a video, we talked about Jesus and how he died on the cross. Well, today we're going to hear more from that true story from the Bible. And we're going to hear all about how Jesus rose from the dead because he didn't stay dead. He came alive again because Jesus is stronger than death. Now, I don't know about you, but at the moment, things can feel a little bit sad sometimes. I know that I'm missing my friends and I'm missing doing all the things that normally I like to do. So I'm really glad today that we can be joyful because Jesus has come alive again. And we can remember all about that. So we're going to start with a song. A song that is really fun and has loads of great actions. So I want you to be stood up now and really ready to do all great actions and show the grown-ups in your house. So why don't we sing It's All About Jesus? Because that is a song, isn't it, about how the whole Bible is all about Jesus. So come on, let's stand up and sing together. <laughs> out by you your spirit wrote through men like a pen in the hand of a god who knew that we would need to know how much you love us so you wrote it down for us forever oh, oh. from genesis to revelation there's one story of your great salvation it's all about jesus oh it's all about jesus shout now So bright, he leads us day by day to the one, the way, the truth, the light. And every time we read, you give us what we need to grow in grace and know you better. Oh, oh, oh. from Genesis to Revelation, there's one story of your great salvation. It's all about Jesus. from Eden we read the serpent will be crushed by a seed of Eve cuz all glory belongs to the Sun every story pointing to the Holy One light when Abraham put Isaac on the altar he pulled the knife but God he never falters faithful to his promise he would provide a substitute ram for the sacrifice and now he gave commandments so we could see his holiness in our desperate need there were so many temporary sacrifices None of them were perfect, no, but Christ is The prophets spoke and they were not liars God would send his very own son to be Messiah Rescue, redeem, restore, reclaim Every saint loves his holy name Cause he died on the cross to take our place The final substitute and eternal grace Then he rose from the grave and up to the throne Until he comes again to gather his own From Genesis to Revelation there's one story of your great salvation It's all about Jesus, so oh, It's all about Jesus Shout now from every page There's one hero that'll save the day It's all about Jesus, so oh, It's all about Jesus Every word is true It's all breathed out by you
Jesus is the King, ruler over everything. Jesus is the one, promise from the Son of God. Jesus is the Lord, He's the one you can't ignore. Jesus, Jesus, He is the King. He is the King. He commanded the fishermen, hey, come follow me. Jesus is the one, promised one, the Son of God. Jesus is the Lord, He's the one you can't ignore. Jesus, Jesus, He is the Jesus, is the King, ruler over everything. Jesus is the one, promised one, the Son of God. Jesus is the Lord, He's the one you can't ignore. Jesus, Jesus, He is the King. really loudly i'd really love to see perhaps some videos of you doing the actions that'd be so great well we sung all about jesus haven't we and we even sung in the song about how jesus died on a cross in our place and he's rose from the grave so let's now hear a true story from the bible all about how jesus rose from the grave and this true story is found in the gospel of mark chapter 16 so I'll read it to you now. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb and they were saying to one another, who will roll the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back it was very large, and entering the tomb they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. They were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, 
from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. But when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. After these things, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking back into the country. And they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. Afterwards, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. So we heard, didn't we, the other day that Jesus died and when he died, he was properly dead and he was put into a tomb with a big stone in the way. But Jesus didn't stay dead. He came alive again. And do you know what? Only God can make that happen. Jesus came alive again because he was God and because Jesus is stronger than death. And that is really good news for us. And we don't have to be afraid of death. Because Jesus is stronger than death. And do you know what? When we put our trust in Jesus, we won't stay dead. Just like Jesus, we will come alive again too. That's what God promises in the Bible. So we don't have to be afraid because Jesus is stronger than death. Can you remember that there was a challenge that Kat gave you the other week? And I think it was on your hand, wasn't it? I think lots of people, you've been, uh, lots of you have been doing really well with this challenge. And you had to think, didn't you, about five words on each finger. Jesus died, I have hope. And we can have hope, can't we? We can have hope because Jesus came alive. Because Jesus is stronger than death. And that means that we, when we trust in Jesus, we won't stay dead we'll come alive again just like Jesus did. So I'm going to pray now and thank God for sending Jesus to die for our sins and thank God that Jesus is alive. Heavenly Father we thank you for your word the Bible. We thank you that in the Bible you teach us all about Jesus. Father God we thank you that Jesus is alive and we thank you that when we trust in you we don't stay dead because you are stronger than death. Lord, that one day we will be alive after we've been dead. So Father, help us to put our trust in you and help us to have joy at Easter because Jesus is alive. Amen. So now, hopefully you'll have some activities to do while Josh is talking to the grown-ups and teaching the grown-ups. And I would really love to see you doing your activities. So maybe the grown-ups in your house can take photos of you doing your activities. That would be really great. I would love to see them. And we really miss you at Kids Church. We can't wait to see you again. But we'll see you next week when we learn more about Jesus. Bye-bye. <laughs>
send the link to all your friends on social media uh, send a text why don't you phone a friend get the word out because we really believe people need jesus second thing grab yourself a coffee get some juice for the kids maybe get an easter egg a hot cross bun and get ready for the service there's going to be some kids activities to do uh, whenever josh is is speaking uh, so why don't you maybe get that sorted in this short time as well and then the third thing to do is simply say hi to people in the chat area uh, tell us where you're watching from have a conversation with people over coffee find out what they've been doing this week and if you've got any questions or if you want to be prayed for then go ahead and just write it down in that chat area if you want to ask something privately or if you want prayer privately then just click the live prayer button and one of the leaders will be able to respond uh, to you now we're going to be starting in about 15 minutes time uh, so i look forward to seeing you in a short while grab your coffee get chatting and i'll see you soon
morning everyone and happy Easter. It's so good to come together on this very special day to, to sing praises to the one who is not dead. He is alive and he reigns in heaven right now. Amazing, isn't it? Well, why don't you tell us in the chat why Easter is so special for you? My name's Chris and I'm one of the leaders here at Cornerstone Church Wirral and we're celebrating Easter this morning with Rooted Church South Wirral and many others from across the UK. So you're especially welcome if you're here today. If you're new, uh, we'd love to get to know you. And there's a link just at the top of the page uh, which says new here. Uh, and we'd love to be able to get in contact and start a conversation with you during the course of the week. So simply fill in some contact details and we can get in touch. Now we've already been celebrating Jesus coming back to life with the kids this morning and they were all so excited. Uh, and I hope that this morning you will be able to join us singing loudly together as we worship Jesus. Now we've been gradually getting used to this new norm. Uh, there's loads of things we're still getting used to, uh, talking to people over videos, uh, finding new things to do in our, ho in our homes and houses, uh, talking to cameras instead of faces. It's weird, but let's just shake off that and let's just celebrate Jesus uh, this morning. There's a few things I'd love you to do as we gather online. The, the first is for the kids. There's gonna be some activities for you to do. Uh, if you've just joined us, you can click on the notes uh, and find a link to the kids' activities. But I've got something particularly special for you kids. I've got a challenge for you. Are you listening? Are you ready? I've hidden a few Easter eggs and that will be on the screen during the singing. And we're gonna be singing before and after Josh speaks to us. And what I would love for you to do is to tell me at the end how many Easter eggs you've been able to spot. Now, can you do that for me? All you have to do is count them all up and get an adult in the room to post on our Facebook page with the number. Maybe even post a photo with you holding a page with the number or something fun like that. Now, kids, here's a clue. The first two eggs are on your screen right now. Adults, remember to use the hashtag CCW online uh, whenever you put your post so as we can find it. And adults, before we jump into worship, as churches, our heart is for the 300,000 people across the world that they would come to know Jesus for themselves. And so we really want our friends, our colleagues, our family and our neighbours to know about Jesus. And so my challenge to you this morning is an easy one. Lift up your phone, write down the link to this service, and invite as many people as you can. Invite them to come and hear about what happened to Jesus during that very first Easter. Uh, share the link on social media. Do an Instagram story and add your friends' names in it so they can see. Phone people, send a text, do whatever it takes to enable as many people as possible to come and hear this amazing news of Jesus. Now I'm gonna be handing over to Jono in just a minute, um, so be prepared for that. But throughout the service, if you have any questions or would like prayer for anything, then just go ahead and write it in the chat area and people will respond to you. And if you wanna ask for something privately, if you want prayer privately, just click the live prayer button and one of the hosts will be able to respond to you directly. But before we, we worship, let me just pray for us all today. Father God, thank you so much that you sent your son to, to live that perfect life that we couldn't live. Thank you so much that that he lived and he came to the cross and he died, that all of our sins might be put on him. Thank you that we are now washed clean uh, by his sacrifice on the cross. And Lord God, I thank you that today we remember that the tomb was empty, uh, that the angels could declare, who are you looking for? He is not here, he is risen. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord, that Jesus did not stay dead but came back to life. Lord God, I pray that you will be with us this morning as we, as we sing praises to Jesus, as we thank him for all that he's done, and as we remember that he is victorious over all things and reigning on high. As so Lord, lead us as we worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. Uh, it's great to have you with us this morning at Cornerstone Church. We're going to stand where we are. We're going to sing praises to God uh, this morning as we're celebrating and rejoicing together in the resurrection of Christ. So join in with us 
Uh, it'd be great to just see those pictures online as well of you guys rejoicing. Uh, so feel free to show that hashtag that's included. I'm just going to read from us now from uh, Romans chapter 6. Uh, we're going to read from verse 5. 
And it just really enforces and reinforces what we were singing about there. And just especially as we're rejoicing this morning in the resurrection and the victory over death and sin. And from verse 5, it reads, For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died to sin once and for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God so that you must also, so that you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now we're going to continue singing now just as we sing Man of Sorrows and really rejoice in the glory and the freedom that we have through the life, the death and the resurrection of Christ Jesus.
Yes, Lord, we just praise you for the miracle of Easter, Lord. We pray you, uh, we praise you for the, the beauty and the glory that we can see in that. Lord, we pray for great joy for ourselves and for those of us who are joining us in worship this morning um, as we come to read and listen uh, to your word, totally um, just in awe of what you've done for us as we celebrate Jesus' resurrection. We pray especially for those this morning who are... Um, just in the midst of pain, of loss, of sadness, uh, especially uh, in the struggles that we're going through at the minute in these circumstances, Lord. Uh, we just pray that the knowledge of the resurrection um, is a great true source of hope and of joy for us this morning as we, as we worship, as we read, as we pray, as we just rejoice in what you've done. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to our online service. And what a great day it is. It is the day we specifically remember that Jesus is alive. It is Resurrection Sunday. What glorious great news. Uh, what a reason to gather together. Uh, we don't just remember uh, Jesus alive on this particular day of the year. No, we remember a crucified and risen Savior all year round. But specifically this weekend, we have been reflecting on the cross and crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, and today, we, we longingly look into the good news uh, and yearn to know afresh the wonder of the resurrection of Jesus and its implications for us today. If you're not a Christian, you're listening in, you're exploring, we have got some great news for this morning. We, 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 John 20, where we are this morning, is, is a beautiful portrayal, not just of the fact of the resurrection, but the transformation that the resurrection brings in our lives. In a world that at the minute certainly feels like we are constantly surrounded by bad news, this isn't merely a good news segment. This is a good news that utterly transforms and changes the bad news. It can mean in the midst of bad news and sorrow and pain and brokenness, we can know good news. Lasting, eternal, life-changing good news. And I pray that for you this morning. The last few weeks in John's Gospel, we've seen that Jesus has made some outrageous claims. That he can bring peace to a troubled heart. That he can bring joy to those who are sorrowful. And today, this is the ultimate claim of Christianity. It is the claim that on these, this weekend events, nearly uh, 2,000 years ago, that Jesus died and three days later rose again. It is a fact that you must reconcile in your mind, either with belief and faith and trust, or you must come up with an explanation as to why billions of people have given their life to Jesus in light of this truth. Sadly, we are daily faced with the grim figures that remind us of the, the spread of coronavirus and the lives that it is taking. It is shockingly painful uh, to listen to those stats and figures every day. And perhaps you have considered afresh your mortality, perhaps in a way that you never have before. C.S. Lewis reminds us that 100% of us die and the percentage cannot be changed. Death is traumatic, death is painful, distressing, it is shocking, it is scary. And as human beings, you've got no option but to face it. But today we see that in the face of death, we can have hope. We can see that God has done something about it. And this weekend, this Easter weekend, pointing us back to the very first Easter weekend, tells us what God has done about it and why we can have hope and why we can be joyful. It is this in Christianity which Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 is of first importance. There are lots of important things in the Bible but there is none so important as this. If this is not true then all the rest is irrelevant. The resurrection is the hinge upon which the story of the world pivots. It has profound implications for your past, your present and your future. In the words of Yaroslav uh, Pelkin, he says, If Christ is risen, then nothing else matters. And if Christ is not risen, then nothing else matters. That's the reality. If Christ is risen, then, then that is the vocal point, the center point of the world. But if he has not risen, 
eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die. Tim Keller puts it another way. He says, if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. And if he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what he said? He's simply saying that everything in the Bible is irrelevant and is unnecessary if Jesus has not risen from the dead. But if he has, you must accept all that he says. So today, consider afresh the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And what are you going to do in response to it? The death and resurrection of Jesus has changed my life. This week on our social media, we've been sharing stories of lives that have been changed by Jesus. And this morning we're praying that Jesus would change your life as well. I'm going to read the first 10 verses of John 20. I'm going to pray for us. And then we're going to unpack this glorious chapter this morning together. So let's read. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to him, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Let's pray. Father God, as we reflect and navigate and walk through this glorious chapter, I pray that you would uh, grant us eyes to see, to behold, to savor the glorious truth of the resurrection of your son, Jesus. Jesus, would you reveal yourself to us in and through these words? Would you grant us faith and trust and, and dependence and love for you? Holy Spirit, would you be working in our hearts and illuminating the glory of Jesus to us afresh? Teach us, remind us of these truths. Grant faith. Open eyes and ears to those who do not yet believe. That they would look in. As John did and believe. And I ask this in your gracious name. Amen. Hope. Transformation. Change in, in, in movies and novels is often depicted with the dawning of a new day. As much as we reflected and meditated on the events on Thursday and Friday of the, the, the beatings and the crucifixion of Jesus, they're, they're into that dark moment where yearning and longing for light. And John chapter 20 verse 1 begins with the dawning of a new day. It is the first day of the week. It is signaling to us that something has changed. Something has happened. It doesn't say on the third day. It says on the first day of the week. Something has changed. Something has happened. There is hope. There is a light is shining in the darkness as the sun rises to cast away the night and its darkness. But what they were about to find, what Mary Magdalene is about to find as she goes to the tomb, is not what she was expecting. It begins with Mary going to the tomb, perhaps much like we may visit the graveside of a loved one that we've lost. She goes and she doesn't find the, uh, the way she left it three days previously, but rather she finds that the stone has been rolled away. In verse 2, she, she runs to tell, to tell Peter and to tell John, who immediately jump up and, and run to see what has happened. Uh, but, but again, she wasn't anticipating the resurrection. Look what she says. She says, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid his body. Peter and John, verse 3 to 7, get up and they run and, and, and almost like quite jovially describes how the disciple whom Jesus loved, outrunning John, who he is faster than Peter, reaches the tomb first and he looks in and he sees that the body's not there. Yet the cloths, these were the cloths that were wrapped around the body of Jesus, were, were laid there, folded. And Peter arrives shortly after and he, he just goes straight into the tomb rather than peering in like John. He goes straight in and he sees the cloths are on the table. But also the face cloth, this would have been almost like a turban type style, uh, is, is folded also in its place 
at the head. In verse 8, John goes in and what he saw he believes. In verse 9 tells us that they didn't quite comprehend or make sense of what was going on for. They did not quite understand that, that Jesus must raise. Though Jesus often told the disciples that he would die and he would rise again. They were not anticipating it. They were not expecting the empty tomb, even though Jesus said it. But they will make sense of it as we make our way through this chapter. You see, they, what they find is not the tomb as they left it three days previously, but the tomb was empty. The stone was rolled away. And, and what we begin to see in these first 10 verses is that the tomb is empty. Therefore, there is hope for the world. And we begin to see that there are certain details in these first 10 verses that help us see that this isn't a fabrication, but rather this is a factual account of what is going on. It's often been said that, well, you know, Josh, we are, we're in the 21st century now. We're a bit more enlightened. You know, we know more than what these first century people knew. You know, they were more into the supernatural stuff. But, but I'm sorry, you cannot hold that. C.S. Lewis would call that chronological snobbery. They were not anticipating the resurrection as much as we, we can't quite comprehend or understand it. They weren't expecting it. Mary Magdalene, even though she heard Jesus say he would rise from the dead, it says they've taken the body, it's not there. The resurrection was seemingly just as impossible to those in the first century as, there, as it is to us today in the 21st century. But there are important details here to help us see that this wasn't merely a fabrication. Look again, we see firstly in verse 1 that it was Mary Magdalene who went to the tomb first. The first eyewitness was a woman. Now, a woman's testimony in this time didn't uphold in court that if this was a fabrication, you would not use a woman to be the first eyewitness person because straight away it would be thrown out of court. It wouldn't be upheld, but they do because that's what happened. You see, secondly, that with the integrity of Peter and John, these were upstanding, trustworthy, reliable men. They were also devout Jews. For them to be radically transformed to worship this Jesus, if he were merely a man who had died, they would not worship him, for they only worshipped God. So therefore, the fact that they saw it and their worship was transformed to worship Jesus as Lord, as God, proves that this wasn't a fabrication but what happened in fact Peter and John don't come off great in the midst of this do they the, the, the fact that the stone was rolled away is another reality that this was a fact that much like today when there's a crime scene cordoned off and there's a police officer standing in front of it saying this is not your property you cannot go in here it's under our possession so likewise the tomb was under the possession of the Roman authorities guards were put there the Roman authorities and the guards would certainly not come off well if this was merely a fabrication. And in fact, if it was a fabrication, they would simply say, that's not true, this is what happened. But the fact is, the Roman guards are not there, the stone is rolled away, and that could only have happened if what we read here actually happened. In fact, look at the grave clothes that we find here. Some, some people have said that, well, well, he was just stolen. There was robbers came and they stole the body. Well, well, just think about that for a second. If you break in and you find a dead body and lots of really expensive possessions, what are you going to take? Are you going to take the body or are you going to take the expensive possessions? Well, what happened here shows that the body's not there, but the expensive possessions are there. That, that, that wouldn't be the way that it had happened. And in fact, if you broke in somewhere, you certainly wouldn't fold the clothes and put them in the exact place where the body was either. In fact, these clothes were so expensive, they were a valuable item. You would take them with you and sell them. You see, this isn't a fabrication about somebody breaking in and stealing the body. This is a fact, not about a, a, a somebody breaking in, but the fact that somebody broke out of this tomb. The, the fact is, is that this grave is not enshrined. There are not pilgrims making pilgrimages to the tomb of Jesus. We don't even know where it rightly is today. Why? Because he's not there. You only visit a tomb if somebody's dead body is still inside. We don't do that like other religions because their, their prophets are dead. Our Lord and Savior Jesus is alive. He broke out of the tomb. We don't travel there. We worship Jesus with the Spirit in us and knowing that Jesus is alive on the throne. This is not a fabrication. This is fact. 
And there is a burden on, of, of proof on us as the church to show that this did happen. And it is so simple when you read the details that this did happen. But there's a burden of proof on you today if you don't believe this. You, you simply can't say, well, I don't agree with the resurrection. You must come up with a historically feasible alternative explanation to the events that happened that were factual and to the fact of the eyewitness accounts and in fact of 2,000 years of history of the church as to why people worship Jesus as the risen Lord, Saviour, King and Ruler. You must come up with an alternative. You can't just say, I don't agree with it. CFD Mule, who's a professor in Cambridge University, puts it like this. The birth and rapid rise of the Christian church remains an unsolved enigma for any historian who refuses to take seriously the only explanation offered by the church. What a great way to put it. It remains an unsolved enigma why thousands, millions and now billions of people today would worship him as Lord if this were not true. It is of first importance. It is factual. But there is an implication that because the tomb is empty, there's hope for us in the world. We live in a day when, when people struggle with the fear of death, the meaningless of life. But the resurrection solves both of those problems. It's the best news in the world because it answers the questions of life now. Is there meaning? Yes, there is. And it answers the question, is there life beyond the grave? Yes, there is. You don't have to fear death because Christ has risen. You can have new life now because Christ has risen. Your life does matter. Christ has risen from the grave. Not only is this true, but we long for this to be true. Leo Tolstoy uh, writes in his confessions uh, around just that idea of the meaninglessness of life uh, and what happens in death. He puts it like this. My question, that which at the age of 50 brought me to the verge of suicide, was the simplest of questions. Lying in the soul of every man, a question without an answer to which one cannot live. It was, what will come of what I am doing today or tomorrow? What will come of my whole life? Why should I live? Why wish for anything or do anything? It can also be expressed like this. Is there any meaning in my life that the inevitable death awaiting me does not destroy? You see, folks, if, if the resurrection of Jesus is not true, life is meaningless. Eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die. If you're not a, if you're not a Christian, you, sh you should long for this to be true. Why? But because we care so much about ourselves. We care so much about our loved ones. We care so much for the world. We care so much for uh, injustice. We, we, we stand against injustice. We stand against the hurt and the abuse of anyone in this world. The fact that Jesus resurrected physically reveals that God does intend to reclaim, restore all that he has made in creation. All that has been corrupted by sin. He's coming again to make all things new. The resurrection shows us that this world world matters. Injustices, pains of this present world are addressed with the news that Christ has risen. Healing, justice and love has won and he's coming again. It, it means that it not just impact our life now but our, our life then that there is life beyond the grave for one has died and risen again never to die. Yes, people have been revived in history, but nobody's been resurrected never to die again. This is news. This is good news for us in the world. The empty tomb means hope for us in the world. Hope in the midst of coronavirus. Hope in the midst of the brokenness of this world. It means that God cares about this world and he cares about the future. The empty tomb proves there's hope for the world. The resurrection isn't just factual but it transforms our lives. And we're gonna see three different groups of people now transformed and changed because of the resurrection of Jesus. Look with me down to verse 11, and we're gonna meet and see what happens to Mary Magdalene. Let's read together. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. 
Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. This is the first resurrection appearance of Jesus, consistent in all the Gospels, and he comes to Mary Magdalene. As Peter and John returned to the disciples, Mary stayed, surely hoping for understanding about what had happened. Imagine the grief and the mourning she was experiencing as the one in whom she had set her hopes, the one in whom she loved, had died and her grief was devastated as the body was removed from the tomb but look at these two angels they say to her why are you weeping it feels a little bit insensitive doesn't it you have you ever had that insensitive person just ask that question or make that statement that was very unhelpful uh, and that's not helpful but here's the only time when you can say such a thing why because because what she's weeping about is not true Jesus is alive. Well, what she's weeping about is the death and the loss of Jesus. They're saying to her, why do you weep? Because what you're weeping about isn't true. These two angels bear bear witness to the fact that God has been at work. And look at it again. She's still not thinking resurrection. How gracious is God to us who still are so slow to get it. She turns around, verse 14 and 15, she sees Jesus, but she doesn't immediately recognize him. But she's not freaked out. Which means our resurrected bodies are, are, are not totally different, but new. And he says to her, verse 15, why are you weeping? What, what a gracious question. You see, Jesus cares for our tears. His question is full of love and affection. But he's helping her see that it's not a time for mourning, it's a time for celebration. He says, whom are you seeking? As in, what kind of Messiah and King did you think I I was? Your your estimate of me was too low. You see, Jesus' life doesn't end with a funeral to weep at, but a resurrection to rejoice in. And and immediately Jesus then says to her, Mary. And immediately she recognizes him. It just reminds me of of John 10, of Jesus being the good shepherd. And it says that Jesus knows his sheep. And his sheep know his voice. Immediately she responds to him. And if you're hearing Jesus speak to you today, respond to him as Mary did. She clings to him, exclaiming, Rabbi, teacher. She's enthusiastic. She's overjoyed. But Jesus says, do not cling to me, for I have not ascended to the Father. Rather, this is not a time to cling on to me. It's a time for action. It's time to announce what's happened. Verse 17, 18, go and tell my brothers what has happened. And beautifully, Mary becomes the first evangelist. She's the first sent one. If you don't know who Mary Magdalene is, she, she was a woman who in Luke 8 tells us that was demon-possessed. She was broken. She was hopeless. She was ostracized in society. She was rejected. She was an outcast. She had no hope for a future. She was enslaved into this way. And she was enslaved probably into other ways in society to get by. She was considered a sinner and one in whom nobody would interact with, nobody would accept and nobody would have time for. But here Jesus, as soon as he's resurrected, who's the first person he goes to? It's Mary Magdalene. What joy that is that Jesus has grace for the broken. That he takes a girl who was enslaved and now uses her as an evangelist and he offers her two things. Look again in the passage to see what he says to her in verse 17. He says, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Mary Magdalene, whose once her life was broken, destroyed, has a new life. He doesn't just give her some advice for self-improvement, 
maybe maybe your story of your life identifies a little bit like Mary's. You you're addicted. You're enslaved to patterns of of of, of and ways of life that you can't seem to break. And 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 just because of those, you don't seem to have hope for the future. Well, well, there is hope here for you in the empty tomb, and there's hope here for you that the resurrected Jesus goes straight to the broken, the outcast, the sinner, the ostracized, the one who is feeling hopeless and in despair, and he gives her grace. Does not just methods not just some self-improvement advice but rather new life and not only a new life but a new family look at his language my father and your father my god and your god something has changed in the death and resurrection of jesus something has changed where he is no longer uh, um, saying that there's a distance but rather there is a union that we are now brought into the family uh, we are now those who are his that that just previously a couple of nights before these disciples abandoned jesus and now he calls them my father his brothers you see everyone in the world is longing for a relationship and community and family and this first easter morning is about the ultimate community the ultimate family the only lasting eternal family the one that that the even the best families merely only point to as a foreshadow of it is known as the church we are all united together that if we are in jesus because of his death and resurrection we can say my father jesus will say to you my brother and sister we're accepted, we're family. For all those who turn from sin and trust in him, we become the brother. God becomes our father. Well, a great implication of the resurrection is that you can have new life, no matter how outcast, how broken, how much sin you've committed. You can have new life, but also a new family. You're longing for love, affirmation, acceptance. You're longing for, for a place to belong, a place to be known and loved. And it's found here in the family of God. Jesus changed Mary Magdalene's life, give her new life and a new family. And Jesus can change your life, giving you a new life, a new purpose, a new meaning. No longer defined by your past and he gives you a new family, an eternal family with a father who will never leave you or forsake you and a brother who died for you. What joy, what glory. Come to believe in him today. I plead with you, believe in Jesus and receive new life and a new family. But it's not just Mary Magdalene, it's not just to, 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 to her he appears, but follow on in the story, verses 19 to 23, he appears to his disciples. Let me read. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you behold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Jesus comes now to his disciples verse 19 it's, it's the evening of the same day the rest of the disciples are together in this this room the door is locked they were fearful when you think about it they were probably some of the chief suspects in, in what to the romans was a crime that that a body was no longer where it was placed by the roman authorities but then it says that Jesus appeared in the room. We, we, we don't know how he appeared in the room. Did he just appear in the room? Did, did he come through the door? We don't know. It just says he appeared. But think about the disciples' perspective. The last time they had saw Jesus, they, when he was arrested, they all deserted him. They ran from him. Some denied him. Some betrayed him. Could you imagine what they were thinking? Oh, no. If Jesus is alive, what's he going to say to us? Is he going to condemn us? But what's the first thing Jesus says to them? Peace be with you. He's saying rather than condemnation, rather than getting a telling off, you get peace. I bring you peace. Look at my hands. Look at my side. He's saying the work that I have done for you in the cross and the resurrection means that we can have fellowship restored. Yes, you may have sinned against me. Yes, you may have left me and deserted me, but I've come back for you. I will never leave you or forsake you. I restore fellowship. And look at their response. They're glad. They're joyful. They're, they're, they're peace has come in the midst of their fear. Joy and gladness has come in the midst of their sorrow and their pain. Why? What is this peace? Well, it's two things. Jesus has brought peace from God. 
Through Jesus' death and resurrection, his sacrifice, he has satisfied the wrath of God, the anger of God against our sin. Through his death, the penalty paid, he can bring forgiveness of sin, eternal life. All that separated us from the Father, remember when the curtain was torn in two, we can now have access through Jesus. There is no peace with God apart from Jesus, and he has made a way. Peace starts with Jesus. And because Jesus made that peace with them, they can have fellowship, they can have peace eternally and one with another. Jesus gives them peace, not as the world gives, but as he gives. He gives them peace, a peace that surpasses understanding. You see, this is what happens in the gospel. Jesus can forgive sins and Jesus can give peace. He can restore peace between you and God and he can restore peace one to another and peace with yourself. To to your fears that you're experiencing in your life in this world right now. He can give you peace. How? You give him your sin and he gives you new life. And you say, well, it sounds too easy, Josh. Surely there must be more to it. No. It's not easy. Jesus had to die for that. The father had to give up his only son so that you could have peace with him. It's not too easy. That's how much it costs. It will also cost you your pride. You need to have humility to repent of your sin and accept his forgiveness, accept his peace. So do it now. Don't wait any longer. Because grace from Jesus when they don't deserve it, peace from the Father through the work of Jesus equals gladness, joy. And he gives them a new purpose, verse 21 to 23. He sends them a mission, as the Father sent me, so I send you. These guys thought they were off the team. And Jesus said, no, no, you're on the team. And I'm using you now to go and proclaim. You can go and proclaim the gospel, the good news, that forgiveness of sins is possible through Jesus. Because he died and rose again, we can be forgiven our sins. Think of it, these these fearful disciples hiding away in the room, cowering with fear. Jesus comes and brings peace and they become fearless. They take the gospel to the ends of the known world. Why? Because Jesus was alive. Some of these guys died horrific deaths and they were willing and were able to. Why? Because Jesus was alive. Jesus' presence, verse 22, as he breathes on them the Holy Spirit, a foretaste of Pentecost. He's saying to them, I will be with you. Here's my presence. And so they went from that place with a new purpose with the presence of Jesus in them, boldly proclaiming peace with God is possible because Jesus died and rose again. Believe in him, repent and have your sins forgiven. The resurrection appearance of Jesus to the disciples brought peace to the fearful and they were transformed from the fearful to the fearless, which brings great hope for you. We're a bit like the disciples, aren't we? Locked into our homes, fearful of what's going on in the world around us, fearful of something getting into us, But Jesus comes into our homes right now and he says, I can bring you peace. I can bring you new life. I can bring you a new family. If only you would repent of your sins and believe in him, the one who died and rose again. And he will fix your fears and he will send you with a new purpose on a new mission to proclaim him. And he will give you his presence. What good news that is, folks. Go proclaim it boldly. This is the purpose of your life now. No longer fearful, but fearless because Jesus died and rose again. Go make that known to the world, folks. And lastly, he appears to one disciple who wasn't in the room at that time, Thomas. Verse 24, let's read that. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called a twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. Thomas is one of the disciples who wasn't around in that first appearance of Jesus to the disciples and if you've got FOMO, that is fear of missing out, that's your worst nightmare. He comes back to the disciples and they say, you'll never guess what happened. We saw Jesus. Yeah, right guys, whatever, good joke. You know, it's hard enough at this time Uh, and you're saying this. No, no, Thomas, we did. Can you imagine? 
And Thomas says, well, I don't believe you. I'm doubting what you're saying. Uh, until I see the nail marks in his hands and his side, I am not believing you. you know, maybe you're a skeptic today like Thomas. Maybe you're doubting the resurrection like Thomas is. And, uh, and what, what is your reason for believing? You know, I see several reasons when I talk to people often, the reason why they don't believe in Jesus. Often it's a moral reason. Uh, you don't want to believe because you don't want to change your life. And that's exactly how a German scholar called Wolfhard Pannerberg says it. He says, the evidence for Jesus' resurrection is so strong that nobody would question it for two things. First, it is a very unusual event. Well, yeah, duh. And second... If you believed it happened, you would have to change the way that you live. I know many people today who cannot deny or reject the reality of, 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 the, of Jesus' death and resurrection apart from the fact that they just simply don't want to change. Don't let your moral doubts stop you from believing in this Jesus. Life of him is far better than any life you have right now. I can guarantee you that. Or maybe secondly, gradually. Maybe you've drifted. Maybe you used to go to church. You used to believe. But over time, you've made small choices and decisions day by day. And you just find yourself now a million miles away. And the journey back to Jesus looks too hard. Too embarrassing. Your pride is too great. Don't let your gradual doubts, the choices you've made, stop you from making that journey. Look at Jesus. The disciples didn't have to make a journey. Jesus showed up with the disciples. Thomas didn't have to go find Jesus. Jesus came to Thomas. Don't doubt him anymore. Here he is crying out to you, believe in me. Maybe, thirdly, you had an immature faith. Uh, maybe you grew up uh, knowing Jesus, believing in Jesus, but then you went to university and, and, and somebody said something and you were never able to answer that question and you thought, well, because I can't answer the question, I'm not going to believe. That's, that's sadly like how a child is tossed to and fro by the wind and the waves, by every cunning doctrine Ephesians 4 would say, no, no, come back to him and see that if the resurrection is real, Jesus can answer that question. Or maybe fourthly, you're like Thomas. Sorrowful Thomas. He was hurt by Jesus. Not because Jesus did something, but because Thomas placed all his hope and love in Jesus and Jesus died. Thomas thought that, that Jesus would bring revolution. He would bring a transformation. He would bring the kingdom of God into the presence of the Roman rule and authority and restore the kingdom of Israel. He had an idea and a design that he wanted Jesus to conform to. And because Jesus didn't do it, he was sorrowful. He was hurt and therefore he died it. Maybe that's you. Maybe, maybe you've been hurt by the church. Not Jesus, but the church. Maybe you've been grieved by how you've been treated by the church. And the church is not perfect. Jesus is making an imperfect church perfect. He's making his bride spotless. But maybe you've been hurt. Maybe you've been grieved. Maybe you're exhausted. Jesus wants to meet you today. He wants, you, he wants to alleviate those doubts. He wants to defeat those doubts so that you would know him. Don't let your hurt grow into doubt. Rather, let your hurt drive you to Jesus and find love and hope and joy in him. Thomas is a skeptic. Maybe you are this morning, but, G but Thomas received truth that transformed him from a doubter to a devoted follower, disciple, missionary of Jesus. Jesus shows up, doesn't he, in verse 26. Eight days later, a reminder, Jesus doesn't work to our timelines. He shows up and he wants to show up and, and we, we bow down and submit to that. And again, Jesus announces peace again. Think of Thomas, think, think of the reason Jesus might have to say to Thomas, oh Thomas, look at the witnesses of your mates. Why do you doubt them? Why do you doubt me? But no, Jesus says peace to you. He shows his hands, his side, and we're not told if, G if Thomas actually puts his fingers there or places his hand in the side. We're just told that Thomas bows down and, and worships and says, my God, my God. This is a, a confession, my Lord and my God. He, he bows down in worship and submission and I'm sure repentance <laughs> forever doubting. And he follows Jesus from this point, which is good news for you today who is a skeptic, who is a doubter. There is grace for you. That, that, that you can have your doubts transformed with the truth of Jesus. Uh, and what, what grace there is, he says, Jesus in verse 29. Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who believe you have not seen me. There is blessing for you today 
You're not at a disadvantage because you weren't in the room. You can believe Jesus and receive a blessing. So it comes to you. We've seen Mary Magdalene's life change. We've seen the disciples' life change. We've seen Thomas's life change. There's only one person's life left to change. That's yours. You're included in the story. Verses 30 and 31. How do you respond to the fact of the empty tomb? How do you respond to the fact that the resurrection means that Jesus has grace for the broken? How do you respond to the fact that Jesus has peace for the fearful? How do you respond to the fact that Jesus has truth for the doubter? Well, it's time for you to respond. Verse 30, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This book, the book of John, the Bible, is written so that you will believe. There's so much more that could have been recorded. There's so much more that perhaps we want to be recorded. But what we had is sufficient and enough to believe. It is reliable and trustworthy. Eyewitness accounts, verified through history. Strong evidence that this is what happened. And the millions of people who bear witness to it ever since, bear witness to you today and say, believe in him. Believe in him. Receive new life. Believe in him because you are currently in death if you don't believe in him. Death is awaiting you and then you will see Jesus face to face and he will judge you and cast you off. Now is the time, the day of salvation, to repent of your sins, receive forgiveness of sins, receive new life and a family. And with a new purpose, with his presence, to live for him until he calls you home or he comes to take us to be with him. Jesus died so that to your death you would have life. So that you wouldn't have to fear death, but you could have his peace. His peace that surpasses all understanding. He laid his life down so you could have life. There's an empty tomb, so there's hope for you. There is a future for you. Jesus is coming again to take us to be with him, where he will restore and redeem all things. So believe in him. What is stopping you? Believe in him. If you're a believer this morning, be assured. Have a confidence a humble confidence yet a courageous boldness to go proclaim the tomb is empty so Jesus is alive proclaim that your sins have been forgiven share how Jesus has changed your life share that you were broken in need of grace share that you were fearful in need of peace share that you were a skeptic but to those doubts truth came and Jesus changed your life this is a glorious day we celebrate Jesus alive it's a glorious day our future is secure it's a glorious day to remember that that the that brokenness and sickness will be eradicated and Jesus will be with us and he will wipe away every tear from our eyes so rejoice he has risen so therefore we have great hope great joy great peace trust him if, if you're not a Christian, then, then why not? Repent and believe now. Trust him. If you're a Christian, enjoy. Live this life he's given you and proclaim it radically to the world. We would love to connect with you. We're jumping into to Zoom groups after the guys lead us in responsive worship. Uh, join us. Connect with us. Ask your questions. Don't run away from this. Don't hide away. Speak up. Ask questions. We'll be honoured and privileged to speak into those those questions you have uh, or right now you can just repent of your sins that is turning away from your sins and confessing your need of a savior and and trusting that jesus has done that in your place and in that moment receive eternal life life that begins now not then now so let me pray for us let me pray for you and let's pray that we would come to know this truth all the more father god i thank you Thank you for the truth and the fact of the empty tomb that Jesus is alive. You raised him from the dead. And because of that, we can have hope and confidence that our sins are forgiven and that new life has begun. And we are brought into your family. We can call you our father. We can call Jesus our brother. Thank you, Jesus, for dying in our place. Thank you, Jesus, for rising again. Thank you, Jesus, that now for your indwelling presence and your Holy Spirit, you transform our lives. I pray that you would administer and minister to those who are broken now with your grace. I pray right now for those who are fearful, you would give them your peace. I pray right now that those who are doubting, you would give them your truth. Jesus, please do not let anyone who is listening to this leave here unchanged, 
not transformed. Spirit, would you grant faith to believe to those who are doubting. And Father, for those who are your people, your family, brothers and sisters of Jesus, would we rejoice in the great news of the resurrection of Jesus and would we radically, boldly, courageously go and proclaim it with a humble confidence rooted in the certainty of the resurrection of Jesus and therefore the certainty of his soon return. I ask this in your gracious name. Amen. Thank you for listening. What a glorious truth to be reminded of. May we sing now and rejoice that Jesus is alive. And if we can answer your question, help you in any way, please, please jump in and ask your questions. We'd love to do that. And if not, we God bless you and we hope to see you soon. Thanks, Josh. Uh, it's great just to spend some more time just rejoicing and, and celebrating this morning. We're going to respond in worship now. So again, please stand wherever you are. Let's sing out loud as we just rejoice and sing to the King of Kings. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets Till a virgin came the world From the throne of endless glory
I'm going to take another reading now um, from 1 Peter verse 1. From 1 Peter chapter 1 even. It's verses 3 to 9. It reads, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, and may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's rejoice in that now as we just continue to reflect on those words. Let's sing about that glory we have, the eternal life that we've got guaranteed and guarded uh, upon high with God in heaven. Let's, uh, let's sing together.
Yes, Lord, we thank you that uh, you, you call us out of that grave, Lord, that we can just rejoice in your resurrection this morning, that you came out of darkness into light, Lord, that you were brought back from death to life, Lord, and you do that same for us, Lord, that in you we get eternal life, through you we get eternal life, and through no other means. So we praise you this morning, we just rejoice and let's um, just enjoy the rest of the day, just basking in that truth, basking in that amazing revelation that we have through you. Um, our Lord, our Saviour. Amen. He is alive. That is amazing news and will always be the best news that anyone could ever hear. Uh, in the chat area, why don't you just share something that's really amazed you afresh this morning, something that has renewed your spirit in these troubling times. Now, I was blown away by the hope that we have because the tomb was empty. What a victory. Jesus is alive and he reigns forevermore. It brings a, a, a sigh of relief uh, to my heart. Well, if this is something new for you, perhaps you've got questions about all that you've heard this morning. And perhaps you know deep down that things just aren't the way they are supposed to be. And what you've heard about Jesus this morning, it, it, it's new to you and you've got questions. Well, I want to encourage you to join us for a Zoom chat straight after the service right? because we would love to help you find the answers to your questions uh, and point you to some next steps. We're going to be running a short interactive course uh, and we'd love you to join in on that to help you find the kind of the world that we all want. Uh, so join us in that Zoom straight after the service or you can click the new here link at the top of the page, fill in those details and we can get in contact with you during the week. Now, the rest of us, we're going to be going from here and then scattering into gospel communities. And that's going to be Zoom meetings and those IDs can be found in the notes tabs also. But if you're not part of a community group or a gospel community, and if you've made a decision to accept Jesus today, then please grab a coffee and join Josh on a Zoom meeting for newcomers and new believers. Right? That's for everyone, anyone on their journey looking to Jesus. And again, the link's in those notes. Uh, but let me just pray uh, before we scatter into those Zoom meetings. Oh, Father God, thank you. Uh, that we can celebrate that Jesus is alive. Thank you uh, for your grace, your love, your mercy for us. Uh, thank you for the hope that we have in that empty tomb and what it represents for the world. I pray for those that have made a decision today. I pray for their hearts as they have decided to follow the risen Lord Jesus. Would you give them courage, Lord? Would you enable them to share what they've experienced with someone else today? Lord God, I pray that you'll be with us as we scatter across the world and beyond today. Would you continue to speak the gospel into our lives? For it's in your name we ask. Amen. Well, that's it from us today. Have a great rest of your Easter weekend. And we'll see you in those Zoom groups shortly. God bless.